You're watching CNN and this is Connect the World. I'm Linda Kincaid in Atlanta filling in for Becky Anderson. Welcome back. Well, monster wildfires continue to burn across California. Two of the blazes have now combined to become the largest wildfire the state has ever seen. The Mendocino complex fire has already burned 290,000 acres and destroyed dozens of homes. Firefighters are busy trying to contain it, but as dry and windy conditions continue, more blazes keep popping up. Just take a look at this aerial footage from a tanker plane. It was originally fighting another fire in north of the state, but it had to be diverted all the way south after this new bigger fire broke out Monday. Well, firefighters are currently battling a total of 16 wildfires across California. I want to bring in CNN meteorologist Chad Myers for the latest. And Chad, these fires keep growing. Certainly do. There's nothing stopping them. There's no rain in the future at all. Just the firefighters trying to get a handle on them. And when they get that big, when they get as big as I'll show you on the map, the fire line is so long. The firefighters just can't get themselves all the way around the fire as it grows out of control. Here's a picture from the International Space Station. Alexander Gertz took this picture from the space station out the window, and you could see the big plume of smoke going up in the air, even at times creating its own wind, creating its own weather, because the air is just rising as fast as it can, and then other air has to rush in, and that air that's rushing in, that's the air that makes more wind. The season is lasting longer, we're burning more acres, and we have a larger population, but the biggest problem is the urban wildland interface, because people want to live in the mountains. They want to live near the trees, and now those trees are on fire. So this is the problem. We go back to 2007, there was a lot of fires. Couple here across the last year's 10, 11, and 12, not many fires, but already this is 2018 to date. These are the fires for the entire year. And fire season is just really getting going here. Mendocino Complex, you talked about that. The biggest one, 1,146 square kilometers on fire. It's right near a lake. They're using that lake for the water to try to put the fire out. But together now, this is the largest fire in history of California. Almost as big as San Francisco Bay down here. And obviously there are other fires across the country. In fact, there are well over 100 fires now burning across the West. The American West has been dry for many, many years. That's the problem. Trees are dead because of the drought. Trees are dead because there's been a weevil, a b boring little weevil that got into the, the trees itself and killed them, killed the sap from going up to the trees. Those trees are still standing, but they're dead. And there's estimates that there's a billion, with a B, dead trees out there that are still uh, ready to burn at some point in time. Hot weather as well. It's hot in Vegas, hot in L.A. Temperatures there will be somewhere around 100, I think, for today. And the temperatures keep going up worldwide, and the fires keep going up in California as well. Linda. Yeah, hard to believe a billion dead trees standing there. Chad Myers, good to have you with us. Thanks so much. You're welcome. Well, as wildfires ravage California, blistering heat waves are sweeping across Europe and Japan. Scientists say this could be the new normal as we approach what they're calling a hothouse state. The report warns that if we don't act quickly, we might push the earth to a point of no return. Our Ian Lee has more. Dangerous fires, deadly drought, and melting glaciers. Symptoms of extreme weather and possibly a glimpse into our future, scientists warn, as scenes like this could become the norm, according to a report from the National Academy of Sciences. It starts with what is called a positive feedback. Man-made emissions freeing the Earth's natural greenhouse gases locked away, like a set of dominoes that can drive global warming. For instance, releasing methane trapped in Arctic permafrost or the destruction of coral reefs, creating what's described as a hothouse, where temperatures stabilize four to five degrees centigrade, that's 39 to 41 Fahrenheit, higher than pre-industrial levels. Right now, the Earth is at about one degree higher. The hot house scenario leads to severe heat, sea levels up to 60 meters, about 200 feet, making some areas on the Earth uninhabitable. Now, if we pass two degrees Celsius, most indications are that we can still adapt. But if we reach three, four degrees Celsius warming, from the evidence we have today, looking back to logically, it would mean a planet that cannot basically serve the modern world as we recognize it. This apocalyptic scenario can be prevented with collective human action, scientists say. 
In 2015, nearly 200 countries signed the Paris Climate Accord, pledging to work to keep temperatures from rising more than two degrees. But under President Donald Trump, the U.S. pulled out, dealing the global agreement a blow. And the good news is that we have more and more evidence that transforming the world to a, you know, 100 percent fossil fuel free world economy is not only necessary, it's both possible, but also has social, economic, health-wise and security benefits. So the path to success is there and the window is still open to succeed. But if action isn't taken soon, then brace yourself. The report says we could be approaching the point of no return. Ian Lee, CNN, Paris. Well, to break it down, I'm joined by Kim Cobb. She's a professor of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences at Georgia Tech and specializes in global climate change. Good to have you with us. Thanks for having me. This report certainly paints a dire picture of reaching the point of no return. Just for our viewers, I want to take them through a couple of the main findings before I get to the question. The report, of course, finding that temperatures could reach and stabilize at about four to five degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels, that sea levels might rise up to 60 meters, and other systems could combine in a feedback loop to further drive up temperatures. So if it continues as is, we could have some parts of the Earth currently home to life uninhabitable. Yes, that's correct. I mean, if we, if we go down this road that we're on right now, we're facing the prospect for some tipping points, some thresholds in the climate system that will simply further accelerate the warming that's already underway. And so we do have some very important choices, and the faster we make them, the more we can contain that tail of damages that's coming down the pike. As we just saw, we've seen those uh, record-breaking fires, biggest fire in California. We've seen record heat waves in southern Europe, in Spain, and Portugal but also Japan, South yes. Korea, and we've seen uh, what is now the worst drought in Australia in living memory yeah. uh, that they're facing. Yeah. So tell us how long will it be if we continue as is before we reach that point of no return? Well, we, we don't know. I think we're already witnessing some of the very stressful consequences of global warming, which is the rise of global temperatures. And one of the most direct consequences of that are these heat extremes and heat waves that are going to continue coming. It's a virtual certainty. And so when we look at the wildfires, we know that there are many contributing factors to wildfires, but heat is a very important one. And so as we warm the planet on average, we're going to have these pockets come up every now and again that are, are just demonstrating that uh, this this heat that's coming is going to be uh, stressing human systems ecosystems um, maybe not every year in every place but again this the statistical package becoming very very clear that these heat extremes and heat waves are are a certainty for our not just future but now and the current US president President Trump is weighing in on the California fires he's tweeted a couple of times now yeah. blaming what he calls the bad environmental laws of California I think we've got one of those tweets I just want to bring it up because he says California wildfires are being magnified and made so much worse by the bad environmental laws which aren't allowing massive amounts of readily available water to be properly utilized it is being diverted into the Pacific Ocean, must also tree clear to stop fire from spreading. And now we've just heard from our sources at CNN that the White House is not commenting on this. They don't know where he got this information from. Right. What's your response to this? I mean, my response is that uh, we do understand so much about the water cycle. We do understand so much about what goes into trying to prevent these kinds of fires. We understand how climate change is impacting heat extremes, which are in turn contributing to fires. What I would say to the president is there's uh, dozens and, and hundreds of climate scientists, just like myself, who'd be willing to sit down with him and talk to him about the science of wildfires and the science of climate change and what we can do to fix this problem. So he need just pick up the phone. <laughs> what would you tell him? You know, when you see a statement like that, where do you start? I say, I would say to him that uh, your your false choice between fixing this problem and building our economy uh, is bad messaging for the American people. They need to know that we can fix this problem and grow our economy at the same time and live a healthier life, not just for our children, but for ourselves as well in the process. So it's not a lose-lose scenario. There are win-win scenarios to fight for, and I'd love to partner with the administration in, in mo moving some of those along. This is an administration that has withdrawn from the Paris Climate Accord, and that accord, of course, is non-binding. They're, they're just, you know, their hopes of what we aim to reach for the countries that are signatories to it. Yes. 
Is that the solution? And if not, what, what are the answers here? Well, it's very clear that without international coordination like Paris, uh, we're going to have a very hard time turning the curve on our current emissions trajectory. Um, however, it's not enough. We also need every citizen of this world to ask what they can do to be part of the solution. They need to ask their institutions, uh, like their universities, their churches, uh, their businesses, to be part of the solution as well. And I've been very heartened by the groundswell of activity in that direction since this administration took office, people recognizing that Paris was never going to be enough, and we have to do it in our own homes, in our own business, in workplaces, and places of worship. That's the positive story from this. Well, it's really great to get your perspective. Uh, Kim Cobb from Georgia Tech, thank you so much for joining us. Always a pleasure. Thank you. Well, this is Connect the World coming up. The U.S. president warns other countries not to do business with Iran. We're going to take a deeper look at that with a special guest when we come back.